Dear Elia, sometimes I think of killing myself. I can remember two moments clearly. One, lying in bed next to your tiny, always needing body, exhausted, sleep deprived for months, seeing no way out. There was no way out. Two, sitting on the edge of the bed as your father walked out of the room, out of my life. A disembowelment, my dreams of love and partnership, family spilling out onto the floor from somewhere in my middle. I still have flashes, moments when I imagine slicing my wrist, the acute burn of the cut, the relief of not feeling anymore. You have always kept me here, resentfully so at first, and now a life preserver, an anchor, a mission. This thing called life is no fucking joke. The world is built on our backs, our wombs, our tears, but it was not made for us and yet I claim it for us. Auntie Eliza writes, the Asian model minority is not doing well. I am not doing well. I'm writing you this letter because I need you to see the crisis that is Asian American life, the civilizing terror that is model minoritization, the neoliberal American dream. Madness as the psychic life of living under siege. I'm writing you to tell you the lie of the thing called wellness. My child, the world makes us sick and then tells us it is our fault. Sickness as individual pathology, a lack of ability or will to achieve wellness. The world tells us what wellness looks like, marks it as normal, moral. Like whiteness, wellness is an ideal to strive for, a state of being in constant performance, invisibilized structures holding up bodies and persons, certain bodies, certain persons, invisibilized structures tearing apart other bodies, other persons. Your worth is not tied to how well you can perform racialized capitalist productivity or gendered constructions of the self-made, martyring, sacrificing woman mother, or what Auntie Erin calls the debt-bound daughter parental sacrifice exchanged for daughterly personhood. People are not to be measured by their usefulness, their ability to perform health, their proximity to racialized gendered ideals. I need you to understand that we are all differentially unwell, that people are vulnerable, made vulnerable, kept vulnerable, that our vulnerabilities are both our death and our life that our vulnerabilities link us, connect us in a web of death and survival. This thing called life is no joke, my sweet child. It is okay to hurt. We must allow ourselves to hurt, to trace the losses, the heartbreak, the death. We must allow ourselves to be whole people in all our brokenness. Our lives, as always negotiating violence, trauma, crises of meaning, our lives as always finding new ways of making meaning, making community. I tell you this to free you, but to also show you how to allow others to be free. In your hands is a project I dreamed for me and for you, for the brokenness we all share so different and so similar. I dreamed this project to save my own life, to help others save their own lives, to help you save yours. Open an emergency, my darling child. It's an emergency right now. So this letter opens a project I curated titled Open an Emergency. And the project is on Asian American mental health and is an attempt to think and feel our way out of circuits that are killing us. I find it necessary to extend this letter to help you understand exactly what it is I'm trying to pass on to you, let me try here. I used to think that we could simply think our way out of problems that plague our communities, that the mind was the most important tool, the most important site of cultivation. Learn more, sharpen analytical skills, see more, find new critiques, generate new ways of thinking. 
This would be what leads to freedom, to revolution. It's why I went to graduate school, why I trained as a scholar. It's what I learned in graduate school as I trained to be a scholar. For instance, learn what racism is and what it isn't. Learn how to analyze what people think racism is. Learn to trace how people's ideas about racism affect actions, dialogues, policies. See what opens up when we shift how we understand racism from individual acts of prejudice to systems of devaluing and exploiting certain lives, systems that find themselves embedded in, expressed through laws, social norms, cultural practices. Ethnic studies as a field, as a set of fields, was born out of a desire to hold up and make visible the lives of those who bear the brunt of these systems of violence and to understand the complex workings of those systems. So learn what racism is and perhaps we can defeat it. Learn what racism is and in the process, unlearn old ways of thinking. Many educators I know talk about teaching as a process of helping students unlearn. Identify and address our assumptions, things we learn from our social environments, from cultural narratives, from educational systems, things that are inaccurate, untrue, or harmful. See the scripts for what they are, inheritances that say more about our community's investments than actually about capturing realities. But this goes for feeling, too. Because we don't just think in learned ways, we feel in them, too. We learn emotional scripts, what we're supposed to feel in particular moments about particular things. We police ourselves with our emotional scripts. And so I found myself feeling my way into motherhood five years ago. Leading up to the birth, feelings of excitement, anxiety about the birth, anticipation, feeling ready, then feeling not ready, enjoying being celebrated by my family and larger community. Most would consider these normal feelings. But what are normal feelings? Feelings that occur often or feelings that fit norms? Feelings that fit our expectations the stories we are told, what we tell ourselves of how we're supposed to feel. What are abnormal feelings? Who gets to say what feelings are abnormal? And then what happens when we have so-called abnormal feelings? We tell ourselves, something is wrong with me. Other people tell us, something is wrong with you. Sometimes this makes people jump off bridges. Sometimes we get put in hospitals or prisons. The World Health Organization defines mental health as a state of well-being in which every individual realizes his or her own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. In Open an Emergency, writer and therapist Kai Cheng Tom wonders why the definition emphasizes an ability to work. Is our health and value really determined by an ability to be productive, to participate in capitalism? What if, in fact, capitalism causes unwellness, as cultural studies scholar Ann Spetkovich suggests? What if depression isn't an individual state of maladjustment expressed through the inability to work, but actually the shared emotional state of life, of working under neoliberal capitalism. And then I wonder about another part of the definition. Can cope with the normal stresses of life? What are normal stresses of life? For whom are they normal? Who gets to deem certain stresses as acceptable and other kinds as too much beyond some imagined threshold? Who gets to tell you what you should be asked to bear? And who gets to tell us how we must bear our burdens, what kinds of coping are healthy? Picture this, you have a new baby. 
the one you've been so excitedly waiting for, the one you began loving from the time you felt her kicks like butterflies in your middle. She is here, and now you feel trapped. You do nothing but care for her around the clock. Nurse, change, rock, hold, maybe put down for a few minutes, but then she's crying again, so pick up and repeat through the night. You sleep in one hour increments, day and night, your life a non-stop routine of exhaustion and frustration and resentment and despair. Despair that this will never change, that you will never sleep again, never have a break, and never have a life outside of her needs. Where is the joy that motherhood supposedly brings? Where is the meaningfulness, the satisfaction? And so you think, something is wrong with me. But not something is wrong with me as in my feelings or indicators of needs not being met, but as in something is wrong with me. You think, maybe I'm not cut out for motherhood. Maybe I've made a terrible mistake. Maybe I am a failure of a mother, of a person. Because everywhere, everyone told you that mothers are supposed to be happy. Mothers are supposed to do everything and be happy while doing it. Mothers are supposed to find meaning in all their sacrifices, martyrdom as ideal motherhood. You find that you can't get other parents to admit, even to themselves, that we sometimes don't feel like it's worth it, that sometimes there is little or no reward, that sometimes we even have regret, resentment, and a desire for something else. You can't even get most new parents to admit that joy might not be their predominant feeling. That is where I found myself, feeling motherhood through these narratives. Earlier, I described open an emergency as an attempt to think and feel our way out of circuits that are killing us. So what are those circuits? And how can thinking and feeling get us out of them? So one, one such circuit, idealized motherhood of contemporary American culture. Another, Asian American model minoritization. It was especially difficult to get my Vietnamese American family and larger Asian American community to think and feel outside of these usual narratives of motherhood because in a world in which we are always trying to become American, striving for an elusive belonging through faith in the American dream in which we work hard, work harder, climb the ladder of upward mobility to find a kind of belonging that might keep us safe, that might bring us security and accumulation, which we often confuse with happiness. In this world, there is no room for motherhood being hard, for anything being hard. Excel, achieve, be normal at all costs. The life of racism, its shape and its reach, not simply in our thoughts, but in our feelings, our anxieties, our insecurities, our loathing and disgust, even our joys, our dreams. W.E.B. Du Bois famously asked about race and being black in the U.S. How does it feel to be a problem? A century later, Vijay Prashad would ask of the South Asian American community, how does it feel to be a solution? In Open an Emergency, literary scholar Erin Ming says that all of her work excavating the dynamics of Asian American life has really been about answering the question of what it feels like to be the model minority. So how do we feel our way out of these circuits, these structures that bear down upon us, giving us affective maps that are killing us? I'm not suggesting that we simply need to feel better or create better feelings. This is not about overcoming anger or other supposedly negative feelings and finding some kind of tranquility. I have a deep suspicion of people telling me how I should feel or that a way of feeling about something is better or healthier. Again, what are normal feelings and who gets to say? Instead, I want to think of feeling as a site of critique a site where we investigate the relationship between feeling and structure. I'm not an affect theorist. There are many doing incredible work in this area. 
But as a cultural studies scholar, as a scholar and writer around issues of mental health, I can observe the cultural scripts in my own life and the lives of those around me and trace the ghostly presence of power to find pathways to resist it, to survive it. So questions I ask you to consider. How can we identify where and how we've been conditioned to feel and not feel? How can we trace how that conditioning is shaped by systems of power such as racism, misogyny, homophobia, ableism, xenophobia? How can we disinvest in those conditioned feelings? And how can we cultivate deeper feeling, different feeling outside of norms? How can we cultivate feelings for things we're not supposed to, in ways we're not supposed to? Many will tell you that empathy is the answer. Compassion as a salve for our era of vitriol and hate. But I write you this letter to tell you that that is not enough. Empathy and compassion cannot be general or generic. They must be specific in response to what we have already been conditioned to feel empathy for and what we have not. To cultivate deeper and possibly revolutionary feeling, we must first identify the scripts we inherit and then feel our way out of them. This means evaluating what you are feeling, weighing its ethical, con ethical possibilities, choosing to reject it if necessary, and cultivating new feelings that perhaps didn't come naturally, easily to you at first. Feeling as a life practice, a political, ethical, spiritual method, open the possibilities of feeling when we open the possibilities of living, of being able to live. This is both my charge and my hope for you. Thank you.